And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a returning good brother to the temple, coming to us straight from Black Oath Entertainment, the madman behind Sacrifice, Incense, and Iron, as well as Across a Thousand Dead Worlds, now coming back with a solo and, co and co-op survival experience in the form of Cair Nathales into the Midnight Throne, which congratulations on getting that funded in an hour, the one and only Alex T., how are you doing today, man? Hey, thanks for having me back. Thank you for com thank you for coming along. So pleasure. Now this is a this is certainly a first from what I've seen of your output, which is which is been full on RPGs. This is a this is a even though it has a co op option, this is largely a solo RPG. How did the idea for of doing a solo um come about yeah so i i just kind of wanted to go back to basics and well i i adore all kinds of dungeon crawlers mm -hmm. i i always had a lot of fun i'm i'm a big fan of of games like uh, for against darkness or the 100 dungeon which is one of my favorite games actually mm -hmm. um but i thought uh, well, they are a little bit lighter in the themes and too typical, maybe. And it's very classical fantasy setting. So I, I, I wanted to do something a bit darker as well as I usually do. I, I you know, I prefer darker settings, mm -hmm. a bit more of grim dark. And um, and yeah, so I just wanted to do something straight to basics. It just done. That, well, I'm not saying I'm not calling it dungeon crawling because. I wanted also to focus on the survival side of, of things. Like uh, you are in a actively hostile environment and it's not only about uh, killing creatures and looting and all that. It's, you have to survive, you have to, in the case of Kernethalas, you have to, for example, I mean, just the fact of resting, it's, it's not a CCS setting camp. You have to, it's like, okay, I'm going to set camp. Do I have enough resources to to set camp properly? Uh, am I going to waste my limited resources in fortifying this place so monsters can't just wandering while I'm sleeping because you, remember you're alone <laughs> mm. and 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 kill me or whatever? Uh, I mean, all the I, I wanted to have that survival aspect. Of course, you need to eat, you need to take care of of your light source, which is more usual in a dungeon calling game. But yeah, so basically, it was just that my my intention to to creating a darker a bit more serious dungeon crawling dungeon survival experience and at the same time doing it in a way where it's uh, relatively simple for newcomers to the genre to to the world of solo uh, role-playing games mm -hmm. so that um it could it, i i see all the time in in reddit and forums and all that it's like okay i'm new to solo gaming where should i start and we always end up recommending the same Iron Sworn, uh, Iron Sworn, um, Dragon's Darkness. I mean, the, the typical thing. So, my idea was okay. I want to make a game that when people come to the to the scene, it gets immediately <laughs> recommended. So, I don't know if I I will achieve that, but I think uh, I'm I'm on a good I'm in a good track for it. I think it's accessible and and it's certainly fun for at least for according to the feedback I'm, I've been getting so far. Mm-hmm. And with that, with that in with that in mind, when it comes to this idea of dun of dungeon survival, um, yeah, I am cu I am curious if um if you're familiar with some with some of the pioneers when it comes to game books, the big the big one that that comes to mind is Death Trap Dungeon. When it comes to when it comes to game books, um, I don't know. The only ones I'm familiar with is the the old ones from the eighties, the ones I was playing with as a child. Um, like um, Death Trap Dungeon was around around that 
in that time. Yeah, no, I, I, I don't, I, I never played it. I, I don't, I don't actually uh, know about it. I'll have to check it out. No, I, I was a big fan of, um, how is it called? I forgot the, the English name right now. Lone Wolf, was it called in English? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, okay. So yeah, those are the books. I, I actually have them here in Spanish. So that was a big part of my my youth and mm -hmm. my teenage early teenage years. But uh, aside from that I can't say I ever played any any other game books. <laughs> mm -hmm. Which I'd i I'd say the vibe that I get from this is that you're trying to go for a mechanic setup that's a bit more complex than a lot of game books had. A lot of it was very, very, si very um, simple. Sometimes revolving around resource management, but not exactly crunchy. It would it be fair of me to say that you're trying to go for this a similar level of crunch that one would see with um with a full-on role-playing game, just with just in a single um setup. Oh, yeah, definitely. Uh, actually, I don't think Ernest Alice has anything to do with uh, with a game book. I mean, it will be almost closer to a board game experience than than anything else. I mean, it's if you know games like uh, like the classical Hero Quest or the or Warhammer Fantasy, and mm -hmm. I mean, well, the classic the one from the 90s also, or the recently released. Um, League of Dungeoneers, which is pretty cool. Uh, it's that kind of game, just in a book. <laughs> so yeah, it it has its. I mean, I, all my games have a little bit of or a lot of crunch, for, depending on who you whom you who, whom you ask. Um, but yeah, I don't know. I think I managed to make it um, accessible still because for me, a game without a little bit of crunch is a little bit. Um, I don't know, almost meaningless for me to play. I don't know. I don't want to. I mean, personally, I I I adore a bit more complex games, and and if I, especially when it comes to character character options, if if I don't have a little bit of things to choose among, I I just get bored. I one of the things that draw me to gameplay to role playing games it's uh, definitely character progression. So in that sense, you need a bit crunchier rules to support a meaningful character progression. I mean, you don't have to, but it, it, since I first and foremost write the games I want to play, and I, they always end up being a little bit crunchy. But yeah, I don't, I don't think you can draw a direct line um, between Kernethalas and in, in gameplay. Uh, books like uh, like the one you mentioned, or or Lone Wolf, or mm -hmm. Fable Lands, or all these. Yeah, and something that something that's also a first for your for your output is that, unless I'm mistaken, you're using a percentile affair with this game. Yeah, well, actually, it's not the first time because my first game I published, which was Disciples of Bone and Shadow, mm -hmm. was percentile. Um, the second one, which was uh, Seekers Beyond the Shroud, it's just these two games. I I don't know them anymore. It's they are uh, the IP belongs now to Exalted Funeral, and and they haven't done anything with it with either of them. So mm -hmm. they have kind of faded in the background because I can't work on them, and actually I don't want to work on them anymore. It's been years, and I moved on from from those games. So yeah, and and recently I've been releasing a. Um, a lot of games based on D100 yeah. systems. If I release uh, Broken Shores, then Rift Breakers, and this will be the third one. And, and to be honest, I, I've always preferred D100 systems because for me they are very easy to understand, for, especially for newcomers. I mean, everybody understands uh, percentages. It's just very intuitive. So yeah, they are definitely my definitely my 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 favorite uh, kind of rule sets. Mm -hmm. And with now with that in with that in mind, for for you, what's the what's the appeal of doing um, D one hundred as a core, as a core mechanic? 
Well, uh, first of all, like I mentioned, is the fact that it's very easy to grasp. And uh, everybody, if you tell them you have 50% chance of of this happening, they're like, okay, I understand immediately. So it's very easy to understand. And the, the typical um, freedom that is usually associated with those kind of systems for you, and also the fact that uh, they are usually... Um, or not, uh, or or um, should I say, almost always a uh, skill base, which is something I prefer. Mm-hmm. So uh, it's it's just uh, it makes sense for me. It's I I love skill based games. It's uh, easy to grasp for newcomers and easy to use, and you you know at a glance without having to add or do anything exactly what the result is. You don't need external target numbers or difficulty class, or you don't need any of those things. So it also aids towards solo playing. I don't know. It has a, a number of things that I think make it uh, perfect for, for this sort of game. Mm-hmm. Now, that br- now the, of course, that brings me to, since you mentioned these, sk- since you mentioned these skills, there's, also, the fact that the core me- that the core mechanics are as much of a- are more of a pool than anything else, whether it be health, toughness, either sa- and sanity, and I'm guessing a- I'm guessing a good chunk of that is in par- is in part due to the whole survival aspect. Like you're not going to be able to just fight a ga- fight a gauntlet without consequences. Yeah. Um... I think it's it gives you a little bit more of, um, well, precisely of survivability and 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 options. For example, the way I I kind of split health. You have your core health, which is very difficult to heal, to recover, and then on top of that you have the pool of toughness, which goes up and down uh, during. Uh, I mean, immediately after a fight, you it go you heal before toughness. And you have most of your spells and skills heal your toughness. The only way of healing your actual health will be through proper rest and certain uh, skills. I mean, uh, abilities, spells and all that. Mm-hmm. So, and having those kind of pulls and the same goes for, for your either, which will be like your mana points. Um, it kind of adds that a little bit more of gamified element where you can see numbers go up and down and you... I mean, you you can see things affecting you, but you you can still en- endure more the the all the combat and and the, the strain that the system puts on 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 your character. So yeah, I I, I think it works well like this. Mm-hmm. And the other the other thing I did find in, I did find a bit interesting is. For, for is the masteries system, and the fact that yeah. instead instead of doing a classless one size fits all, that's that's would be t- would certainly be tempting to approach. You've got quite a few, for lack of a better term, classes. Even though even though they're just tiers of ma- mastery, I'm just calling it that just for habit. Um, is it? Is it a case where you're where someone's expected to um, advance along s- several t- several um, tracks of masteries, or are they going to be picking a few picking a few particular ones? Yeah. So the idea behind the masteries was that, like you said, it was very easy, and is is usually my first inclination to make classless systems, especially when it comes to something like. Uh, D100 system, like I mentioned before, it's they are skill based. Mm-hmm. So it's easier to make classless systems, and that was that's always my natural inclination because I personally I'm not a big fan of classes which really lock you into a fixed uh, gameplay style. So I try to avoid that design that kind of stuff. Even though it's interesting, it can be fun and all that. I I enjoy a lot of games that are class based. Most of games are class based, and I. I have a lot of fun with them, but when it comes to my own games, I generally tend to design them, uh, attempting to make them uh, classless. But with the mastery approach, my idea was again um, making it a bit more newbie friendly and more accessible, 
because this way you have a pre-packed set of abilities. You you know the flavor of the class or whatever you want to call it, the mastery. You know it's like, okay, if I want to play a sneaky guy, is this mastery. If I want to play more like a necromancer, is this other one. Yet still at the same time, you have you start the game with two masteries. So and each mastery has uh, five tiers. When each tier is a uh, well, each mastery first of all gives you a passive ability, which you acquire immediately. And and when you start the game, you start with two ability points, which you can then well you are obligated to spend one on each of your masteries. So basically, you start uh, with two different masteries. There are twenty of them. And you start having you 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 have unlocked the two passive ones and the first two tier one abilities. So then each time you level up, you receive a new ability point, mm -hmm. and you can spend it on either one of your masteries. But on top of that, then during gameplay you can find a third mastery which is tied to amulets. So. You can find uh, all the loot in the game is randomly generated, especially mm -hmm. all the uh, magical items. Everything is is like Diablo; it's all randomly generated. So, if you're lucky enough, you can find an amulet which will have a mastery that you don't have, and then, well, you can just continue spending points on that uh, third mastery. So, essentially, with, you start with two, you end up with three. And and it allows you to customize your character quite quite nicely because you end up uh, with uh, 15 active abilities and and three passives uh, by the end of the game. So yeah, mm -hmm. quite a lot of flexibility. You can end up making a tank which shoots fireballs and 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 summons the dead. Or I mean, what what are, there are a total of 11 uh, um, mastery abilities mm -hmm. plus the 20 passive ones so i mean yeah there's a lot of, of jiggle room you can combine a lot of stuff mm -hmm. and when i look when i look at the when i look at the when i look at the monsters and i i do see that there's pl there's plenty of um customization as well as slight as well as a um sliding affair so that so that they can still be something of a threat even when you're even when you're higher level um yeah but i also know i also note that the the health rating for monsters isn't all isn't all that high i i'm not i'm not sure there's going to be all that many that's going to have health in the in the double digits uh is uh, it no sorry sorry go ahead uh and i th is it a is it a case where, um, the, where where um, health isn't high, but da but damage certainly can, certainly can be, not in terms of you go you go down in one hit, but you go down in um, in se in in a few hits if you're not careful. Yeah. So when it comes to that kind of uh, enemy stuff and, and, and balance um, it's always the trickiest thing to, to get right when designing a new game at least for me the, the combat balance and all that I tend to make games a bit too deadly and <laughs> I always need several passes to, to tone it down tone it back because it's a uh, it's a bit too much but I think I this time I got it uh, right of course after a lot of playtesting and and for me the the goal with with the enemies was less the fact that a single enemy is is the is going to well it has the capability of killing you and more um focusing on on how not maybe the first one but the fifteenth uh, enemy that you face you are already extremely tired your resources are low um your your health and your toughness, your everything, you're 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 screwed after a lot of um, after facing a lot of uh, danger in in the dungeon. So it's it's more of a game of uh, exhaustion and and wearing you down mm -hmm. more than a single enemy being able to kill you. Of course, I mean after a while, even a rat, after you've killed 
200 rats, the 201 rat will be able to take you down. So in that sense, it's a, it's a game of balancing your resources, knowing, playing smart, knowing when to rest, and and yeah, trying to to survive by being by being a bit clever with with your resources, with your health, with and being a bit lucky, of course, because everything is randomized. Mm -hmm. You need to get lucky with the with the crafting materials you find, with the medical supplies, with all the stuff you rations or well, all that stuff that is linked to to resting, to setting up camp where you have your crafting, you repair your gear, you you craft torches, um, bandages. I mean, all the all the typical survival elements that you can think of. Uh, you'll deal with all that in the in the camp. Mm -hmm. So the enemies, yeah, they they do increase uh, the higher your level. Mm -hmm. It's generally after level five they they get a boost, and then after level ten they get a, another final boost. And and I think it works pretty well. At least uh, play testers haven't complained. My own play tests have gone well. So yeah, I, I think the balance is is generally it. It may look easy when you first start off because like it's like okay, I I kill five enemies. Um, I just lost a couple of health points, uh, and I, I I'm doing great. But when you when you Take into consideration that it's not only the enemies; it's there are traps. Uh, you are hungry. Uh, you, your sanity—that's a huge deal. Actually, uh, the times I died, I died more because of loss of sanity than than health. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a lot of different elements that they slowly but surely wore you down, and and so having the very difficult and tough enemies—it's it was a little bit too much. I think I think the balance is it's right. Yeah, and I also no I also noticed that you you brought in the usage die that was pi that was pioneered by the black hack, uh, which is a natural is a natural thing to use in in this particular system. Yeah, I think it's a fantastic tool, and and I actually have been extrapolating it and applying it to a lot of different uses lately. And not only to keep track of um, of uh, consumables and gear and all that kind of stuff, torches and whatever, uh, but also to to keep track of whether you find in the, in the case of Carnathalas whether you find the the overseer because each section of the of the gigantic almost infinite necropolis that you are forced to to explore. It, it, it the it's divided by by sections the the whole the whole place and each section it's ruled by an overseer which is kind of a the level the boss level and um so to keep track of both where the the overseer is and both and the and the section sex it is i i use I use the I use the usage die and and well yeah I use it for a, for a lot of different things I think it's a great replace it's a great replacement for the, um, the famous clocks which people like so much they were introduced in in um, Blades in the Dark I think it was mm -hmm. well at least Blades in the Dark uses it a lot and uh, but I, I don't I don't know I think they're a bit annoying because you really need to t keep track of them actively instead of passively it's like it's like okay now it's when the when the clock moves it, 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 it moves over here now here you there's certain moments where the rules clearly state you have to make the the check and if the usage die re, it's reduced well then when it, when you reach the last stage then something happens so i think it's mechanically much cleaner it takes less from the because as a solo player, for me, the goal is to minimize the number of decisions you have to make outside of your character. So the less you manage to play as the game master, for me, that's a win. So this kind of tools that mm, allow you to focus on what your character will do instead of what's happening around the character and try to... The, the less you have to separate from your character, the better. And and this is a way of, of doing it that I think is quite elegant. Mm-hmm. 
Now, when it comes to the when it, when it comes to just going through just going through the this uh, this underground lab, labyrinthian monstrosity, as it as it were. Mm -hmm. uh, obviously, obviously there isn't a there isn't a hard and fast map, but when it comes to Wait, how um how in the, how much of a necessity do you have it of having a dungeon map in the traditional sense? Uh, sorry, I didn't. I, I didn't, the connection broke for a second oh. here. How much of a necessity? What? Sorry. Would would you do you see ha, do you see having a traditional du, traditional gridded out dungeon map? As a necessity, and I do mean, see, do you see it as not really? No. <laughs> ah, no, because uh, I mean, uh, the game has the, the, the it comes with a uh, hundred different tiles, so mm -hmm. you are you are supposed well, or not necessarily actually, but uh, for a lot of people, uh, in me included, part of the fun with this kind of games is creating the map as you go, so you. Each time you have to move on to a new, well, you, of course you have to figure out if you're moving into a corridor or, or just a room. So you roll on the table to see what shape that corridor or room has. And then you just draw it on, on your, your grid paper. But if you don't want to do that, it's perfectly fine. You can take, uh, I mean, the, the rules um support playing with any map you have hanging around you can go and download one of dyson logos maps which he has hundreds and hundreds of them and you can go room by room it, i mean you can see the whole layout and it doesn't ruin your experience because you still don't know what you find on the rooms if you're using all the tables and tools in the, in the book of course you still don't know where the big body is you don't know which encounters you're going to have or what kind of loot you're... I mean, you don't know anything. As long as mm -hmm. you r use the rules in the book to generate what happens and what you find in the dungeon, it doesn't matter what shape or or or, or size the, the dungeon itself has. So... And, and the game, yeah, the the core game is randomized, so you are... It, it's, it is assumed you're using all the tools in the book, so you will be exploring a randomly created a um a generated a dungeon with all different rooms and, uh, and corridor sizes and shapes but it also um includes for example the beginning area it's a fixed map so that's an example of how and on and now during the kickstarter we unlocked a, a, a different fixed map which is the the bone fields mm -hmm. so that will be a different map the only thing that will be fixed and for everybody, everybody will share is the shape and the how the map itself looks. But the what you find in each room and all the different encounters and all that, all that is always randomized. So yeah, if you like to map, you can map. If you like to use random tiles because you have random tiles from other games or whatever, you can use those. Or if you want to use a fixed map from whatever game or whatever you find on the internet, you can use it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can. I can certainly get behind that. Now, of course, of course, there is the possibility of do of doing more of more of co more of co-op than full-on solo, and. With that in mind, how how do you maintain that same degree of tension of survival when you're de when you're dealing with multiple pe multiple people in the dungeon instead of just one? Well, first of all, I, I I wouldn't recommend playing with more than two people. I would say, or maybe three, because yeah, it even though the game balances itself out, you can it. I mean, the more more players you have, the more challenges you're going to be facing. But it does get easier because, for example, when it comes to traps or I don't know, of trying to scavenge a room, all those kind of things, if there's more than one person, one player, you have more chances of of being successful. Mm -hmm. So that kind of thing, um, it definitely makes it easier. But 
on the other side, um, you still have to deal with more danger. There are more enemies appearing. Um, the loot, um, even though each player gets a, a different loot roll, because I, I really thought about that and uh, you had the option of going old school Diablo first where everybody, everybody had to share the, the loot, but I thought uh, I, I'm going to try to keep it um, newbie friendly and, and, and simplify this kind of things and just uh, let everybody get their own loot roll. And but but yeah, enemies are generally tougher. They activate ext an extra time for each uh, player character, so they they have more action. So more or less, the, I think the, the the game adapts quite nicely to to bigger challenges. Even though it is going to be easier just because of the couple of things I mentioned, like the extra chances of finding more things when you're scavenging a room or or somebody fails at. Uh, trying to disarm a trap, but they don't trigger it because, of course, you, if you disarm a trap, most likely you're going to trigger it, but maybe you don't. So then maybe somebody else will try to disarm it. All those kind of things, it definitely makes it makes it easier. Mm -hmm. Now, with the with that said, what would you be shooting for as far as the total page count of the of the project? Oh well, the 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 game is completely it's done. I mean, it's already uh, as you've seen it. It's it's two hundred twenty seven pages. Mm -hmm. The thing is that we've unlocked a couple of things on, on during the campaign, the Kickstarter campaign, and I'm guessing we will unlock at least a couple more of, of stretch goals. So all that extra content it's going to be part of a small zine. Mm -hmm. uh, which actually I am planning of of uh, releasing a kind of unperiodical uh, uh, zine. I don't know, uh, like maybe twice a year, something like that. Which I'm calling the Bylorian Codex. Mm -hmm. So this this will be, um, I don't know, issue number zero, maybe the f just directly first issue. But yes, all this stuff we unlock will go into into this zine because that way the moment the campaign is over I can uh, people who backed they don't need to wait for me to finish all the writing all the stretch goals even though I already started uh, finishing the layout getting the new art uh, that way they can d directly get the the finished product which is the the core book which right now it's only missing uh, seven more illustrations and that's it so yeah, it's it's by the time the campaign is over and and Kickstarter finishes processing all the payment and and all that stuff, uh, yeah, I think the the game will be one hundred percent finished. So it's it's actually great to be able to finish a campaign and and give the finished game to to the players. So yeah. Mm -hmm. And. I do. I do want to give my congrats on how well the how well the campaign has been doing. I wouldn't be surprised if you if you guys end up getting getting pat um getting past um twelve twelve thousand bucks or or eleven thousand um year eleven thousand euros, which is quite impressive given that you were only asking for about two for about two thousand euro when when this whole thing started. Yeah, thanks. It's it's been quite nicely. I, my my main goal was just to cover the the art. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> once that that's done, the rest was just extras and and then, well, and of course I I really really wanted to unlock the cards and which we did yesterday. We reached that we hit that stretch goal, which is amazing. Mm -hmm. And and yeah, that's a fantastic addition for this kind of game. I mean, a set of cards instead of having to check the tables all the time, and in each time you have an event or encounter all that, instead of flipping through pages and all that, you just grab a new card and there, there you go. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's really going to speed up the process of of playing the game. I'm I'm super excited about that. Yep. But with that said, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come all the way to my temple and enjoy the madness that happens here. And 
Anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. Thanks so much. And of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there'll be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty everybody!